Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Nights Podcast. Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with the juice to get you through the long night. And on today's episode of Obsidian Nights, we will be discussing Eddard 5. And today's special guest is Top Shelf Fandom, Justin, a reoccurring guest. Yes, reoccurring. Yes. (laughs) Would you Uh, like to let the people know where they can find you? Yes. And what your deal is? Yeah, my deal is evidently I'm going to go get my name changed down at the county, the Top Shelf Fandom. Uh, and <laughs> That's your channel name. No, well, I'll do what you tell me. And uh, <laughs> But I was formerly known as Justin Thomas. So no, yes, from Top Shelf Fandom. Can't wait to get into it. Loving it. Can't praise Obsidian Knights enough. Uh, and uh, this should be a fun one. Yes, I'm so excited. I, this is actually a short chapter. Like, I know it just came off of like a two hour podcast. And then I had like... 45 minutes with Quinn talking about old man, but this chapter is actually really a short chapter. So this episode might not be that long, but we do have a lot to discuss. So we're in King's Landing and Eddard Stark is going to meet with Grand Maester Pycelle. Grand Maester Pycelle in his self is, I cannot stand him. What are your feelings on Grand Maester Pycelle? In every way, he's terrible. He's gross. This reminded me of how George likes to really like exemplify or amplify whatever the proper verbiage is, uh, how gross uh, people can be like with the coughing up of his phlegm, like everything about Pycelle sucks. Like, I don't know how he became the grand uh, maester, but, you know, not- one of the scenes in Game of Thrones that I love so much is when Grand Maester Pycelle is talking to Cersei and Cersei's like, every draw, every breath you draw in my presence annoys me. <laughs> like, yeah. And that's like, because that's how I feel about Grandmaster Parcel. Like, I really cannot stand him. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'm not all for, like, getting people killed. But, like, I'd probably have this guy killed. Flip like, once a horse. A, yeah, an accident, <laughs> per se. But, yeah, yeah, not a fan. I don't think there's any huge Picel fans out there, though. I haven't seen too many Picel shirts. Oh, and they were like, so in the beginning, Grandmaster Pycelle was all like, I can offer you a cup of iced milk with mm-hmm. sweetened with honey. I find it most refreshing in this heat. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like if I was like going through heat exhaustion, <laughs> which is kind of what like Ned's coming from cold ass Winterfell down to the south, like he's sweating, his clothes are sticking to him and stuff. The air is really thick and humid. And like just to offer him milk, <laughs> like what the milk, like to me, milk was a bad choice, anchor man. When he's when he's really hot, yeah. Uh, I would feel like I would throw up. You like, would. It's really yeah. They're really really like cementing down that it's hot in this chapter as well. Like how hot it is. Like I was gonna ask you if it was hot or not as a joke because <laughs> George is. Re- and I get why he's. And I'm not. I'm not complaining. I just think yeah, definitely. I heard that too earlier when I was listening, and I was like milk and because i'm i'm lactose intolerant so that that doesn't speak to me one bit but yeah i I didn't care for his his bad everything about him sucks here's some milk and honey i mean like i guess that's a greek god thing that's how the gods bathing in milk and honey and all that so just a weird old man thing to do yeah it's it's really i don't i don't know but anyway so Grand, the Grand Maester Pycelle says to Ned, the small folks say that the last year of summer is always the hottest. It is not so, yet oft times it feels that way, does it not? On days like this, I envy your northerners, your summer snows. So there's all this like in A Song of Ice and Fire, there's all this like theorizing and stuff that goes over on around the seasons so the winter and the summer like summers last a generation winters last like this summer has been what 16 years longer than a 16 year summer (laughs) there's a fundamental misunderstanding 
of how the seasons work within. And I don't know if this is a narrative on or a dialogue on like climate change, you know, like, you know, if there's anything in the subtext here, because like this is a man of supposed science at this point. Right. And I don't know if this is like any type of a take on that. I'm not trying to go all that way. But I did. That did pop up when I reread this chapter. I was like, oh, he's kind of a denier. He's like, those fools, they don't know. He's like, yeah, hey, summers always I mean, last it, 17 years. It's it's like um, in the world of ice and fire, there are quotes about at one time they could predict how long the summers were going to be. But George has been on record and ha- has said that the seasons are the way they are due to magic. It's magic. It's like it's not science. Because I know like some s- colleges, like some science majors at certain colleges have tried to like figure it out through science by using like binary, like saying that like Westeros or Planetos has like some binary solar system. But that is not the case per George R.R. R. Martin, the author of these books yeah it's kind of it's kind of in line too with like the feudalistic way of thinking like even during like the like henry tudor it would be common for people to think that things were bad because of like actions so like i i kind of take you know that the maesters obviously they're they're from the church per se right so they they kind of push that narrative it's like oh why do we have a bad yield in our crops it's like well because jesus doesn't like you that's why (laughs) obviously (laughs) Well, I know like, okay, so I wanted to talk about this one quote and it's it's about the great summer. So obviously there's some prophecy or something at the Citadel that talks about the great summer and the great summer is the summer that never ends. And this book series is A Song of Ice and Fire. So the long night is like the winter that never ends. So the White Walkers want to bring on the winter that never ends and then there's this possibility of the summer never ending. And to me, they are both like equally bad. Like there needs to be some balance between them, not either or. Like it's, it can't be like even a summer that never ends would be bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's just a, a story of excesses and a story of absolutes, right? Uh, of one way of ruling, one reign, the Targaryen reign that was also I guess metaphorically, probably a poor one on my part, but a long summer of sorts, you know, a summer, long, a long burn per se. And then, you know, a change in guard. So a change because the, the conditions in which a civilization or a culture lives within, it crafts uh, the way which they need to live, which is their values. So, yeah, I think that you see a lot of class separation during this time, obviously, you know, because if it's winter all throughout Westeros, uh, whether or not it's colder or not in the north, which it would be. But, you know, people would be more in line with each other. So there's there's a, a degree of separation, right, because of this long summer as well. I think I think it furthers the south and the north. I think that that's unavoidable. So I do think that um, this great summer and this great winter, they are some kind of play on a song of ice and fire metaphorically. And it could have to do with climate change. It could have to do with the others and the dragons. It could have like, there's so many possibilities, but the reason like, like Lord Pycel or Maester Pycel is talking about all of this shit. But really the reason that Ned is there is because Ned wants to know what's good with Lord Aaron, John Aaron. So in the beginning of the story, we know that John Aaron, who was handed the king to Robert Baratheon, was killed. We found out via the letter from Lysa that he was murdered. And it was likely the Lannisters that murdered him. Well, Lysa implicated the Lannisters. So while we're in King's Landing with Ned, Ned is trying to like solve this murder mystery, like this who done it. Yeah. story so like there's a lot of things going on and who killed john aaron is a big part of ned's story yeah the, i like this chapter because it really combines like the two things in which he is trying to suss out right like but they have a common thread for him at least and i, I mentioned this to you earlier but this really shows the, the folly in his way meaning that he is a very simple man this furthers you know what we all already know not to be captain hindsight here but at the time if you're a first time reader this should become more and more clear for you that that Ned is, or at least, you know, become more important to you as you read on through the next few chapters, that Ned is a very simple man. He's trying to figure out what happened and he is trying to juggle these two things. The, the first thing is, you know, obviously he's there because he's become the hand of the game. 
But the the concern is what happened with Bran, as well as what's going on with how John Aaron passed. There's something suspicious about it. He finds out from Catelyn, I believe, in one of the chapters in which we covered on this podcast. So it's interesting to see him t- try to multitask this, but also to to conclude that it's one evil. Because for a man like Ned, things are very simple to him in the sense of there are bad people and those bad people are going to be clearly and overtly bad, right? Those are the Lannisters in this case. And he's going to tie these two things together if something doesn't add up. And his inability to see that, yes, the Lannisters obviously are not great for the Starks in this time at this moment or really ever, right? As far as the books go. So he is blind, though, my point, long-winded, is that he is unable to see that just because the Lannisters have some blame for it, that there are other things at play. He is very grateful for anybody that gives him information that provides, it's not like selective research, I'd say it's verging on that, meaning like he has a a, a hypothesis, right? And he's going to prove it, so he's only going to suss out the information that's advantageous to it. But it is like that to a point, it's more ignorant than malicious, if that makes sense. You get what I'm saying? Like he is able to see the, the game. Yeah, like he's not purposely, willfully ignoring things. Yes. He's just... He has this thought in his head and he's looking for the information that matches that thought and ignoring the information that goes against that thought. Or any complexity to it, right? Like like the idea that if somebody's honest with him, in honest is, you know, depicted in the sense of it's going along with his hypothesis. Uh, and he, he, he concludes, he's like, I concur. And he's a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes here, but a shitty one. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting uh, chapter because he is juggling and we get our two major plot threads, at least for the, for Ned, especially and really the first book in general here. What's going on with Bran and what happened to get Robert to this point? What's going on with the Lannisters, right? Yeah. And one thing I found interesting is like, we know that Graham Maester Pycelle is pretty much Cersei's creature. Like he's pretty much um, Lannister to the bone, um, supportive of House Lannister. But at the same time, he does give Ned Stark this book. Why? Like, why does he give him this book? I feel like if he didn't give him the book, then Ned wouldn't have been able to piece things together as easily as he did. There is two things that stick out. One is the book. That's a really good point. I kind of forgot about the book, to be honest with you. That's a really damn good point. Why did he give him that book here? My major foible, this might show my ignorance, right? Wait for it is that that he talks about how he's seen, you know, the rules of three kings, right? So we get a little mm-hmm. bit of backstory here. So this, again, shows there are a few people, Varys being one of them as well, you'll notice, that are at the whims of many uh, kings, you know, like multiple kings. Uh, Varys, as well, is one of these men that, you know, Ned isn't uh, too quick to really, I mean, he's not too quick to speak of the virtues of to anybody, really, other than his, his own people. But uh, besides that, you know, we do question a little bit the loyalties because these are men that have survived multiple administrations per se but i mean this is a feudalistic landscape in which the one king was burning people to death right so like this this is very interesting to me and i was like ooh, so like that's got to make a guy like ned think like you i i brought this up to you that that ned looks at people that are clever in no way can that be good to be clever because to be clever to ned means you must be clever because you aren't telling the truth right like kind of always call something what it is, meaning like give the proper title or description of what you're doing. And you'll never have to like tell a lie. You'll never have to remember anything because you've always told the truth type of like, you know, obviously we know Captain Hindsight, it doesn't work out great for Ned, but he's very idealistic. So to be clever is to be shady. You can't be clever without being shady in Ned's book. So yeah, but the, yeah, why did he, maybe just is like, I, there's really no great explanation for that. I'm going to go ahead and plead the fifth on it, but I will go ahead and cough in uh, plot convenience a little bit on this. I'm not Hayden. I'm saying though, it, it make a yeah, lot of sense. It, it does make sense for plot convenience, but at the same time, I think that Grand Maester Pycelle, because we don't get a POV from him, we don't really know where he, what side he's on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's on House Lannister for now. Like all of these people are on house lannister's side for now because they wouldn't have been able to pull off what they pulled off if without those people but they can change at any time uh, a servant to many to, to many lords right exactly so, yeah no you're exactly right no yeah I, I i take back plot convenience we we would have to believe that he's at least hedging his bet right like he's right. Saying, like okay so at least if shit goes you know down the drain with the lannisters i can be like yo remember that book i gave you that was a like i mean 
all jokes aside, that's a very valid. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I've changed my stance on this right there. That that's a very valid point. He's hedging, <laughs> no, it's true though. That's a he is hedging his bets. That's smart, and it's a way that it's like, eh, yeah. So I gave him a book. It's really nothing the Lannisters can take his head for either, right? Right. Um. So John Aaron's last words were, "The seed is strong," and that is that is a theme in this book the seed being strong lisa thinks it means you know like sweet robin is strong <laughs> <laughs> lisa oh lisa. but when we get to see robert's other bastards we know that it means that the Ro- robert baratheon's seed is strong house yes. baratheon seed is strong there whenever they have had relations with a lannister that have resulted in children those children have been born with black hair yeah, and also the Lannister seed is is very. I mean, mostly because it's it's not inter- intermingling. I mean, it seed. should be the Lannister seed should be strong, being that it was two Lannisters. Yeah, it's pretty clear that those aren't. We were talking kids, about Joffrey, yeah, yeah, Joffrey, and Marcella but both are strong, Thomas. right? Like, there's no Baratheons with blonde hair and blue eyes, and there's no uh, Lannisters, uh, you know, like brown hair and uh, green eyes. Or what? What color does Robert have? I can't remember. Robert's eyes are blue. No, beautiful blue, blue eyes. Those are beautiful eyes. Yes, and uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So the, they both have very distinct traits. So like, yeah, you shouldn't look if you looked at a Sears family portrait and you're Robert Baratheon, you should be like, wait a minute. So, something's not right here so both sides yeah but that is an odd thing to say at the end of your uh, life yeah unless you're a gardener right garth the so, greenhand said that as well he probably did yeah so ned um asked him did it seem to you that there was anything unnatural about lord aaron's death unnatural the aged maester's voice was thin as a whisper no i could not say so sad for a certainty Yet in its own way, death is the most natural thing of all, Lord Eddard. John Aaron, rest easy now. His burdens lifted at last. So first of all, Maester Pycelle knows damn well that his that John Aaron's like he Maester Pycelle knows. Yeah. He's not he didn't become Grand Maester because like he got elected to the position. Like he had he has How is that done? Is it an election though? Yeah. Is, no. No, it's, you're, it's like an appointment. Okay. But he has forged his chains. He has forged all his maester's links. And he's not an idiot. So he knows a poison at work when he sees a poison at work. Um, He's definitely covering here. Yeah, but also he's feigning weakness, right? Like the way in which oh, George yes. is giving him a, the thin as a whisper. So like, again, like, because we see this even in the series, right? Like where after the the lady of the night leaves respectively, like <laughs> he is spry. So like he's feigning like, you know, his uh, how fragile he is. And he he is oh, presenting yes. himself as not being a threat as well. So he is a clever fox. He's, he's very cl- clever. Yeah. He's very clever. And, you know, there's a deleted scene. I wish it was in the series proper because it was such a good scene. Tywin Lannister is fishing and Maester Pycelle is talking to him and breathing all raggedy and fiending weakness or whatever. And Tywin just straight calls him out on it. He's like, you know, am I the only one that sees through this bullshit? (laughs) He's like, yep. He just calls him a right out. Yeah, maybe two on the nose. But yeah, that Tywin would be the one because Tywin is the master manipulator. So he would be like somebody, and I'll admit to even some extent that I don't appreciate. I if somebody's lying to me, I appreciate good form. I hate when I see bad lying. Like I'm more willing to. I'm like, listen, if you're gonna be a piece of crap, be a good one. Be a be a, a polished, one. be a polished turd, you turd. Be a polished piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna. So- yeah. Sorry. Also, oh, that's fine. Also, in this chapter, they talk about um, Jaehaerys Targaryen and Jaehaerys' father. His father supposedly being named Aegon the Fortunate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there is no Aegon the Fortunate, the fifth of his name. And the fifth Ooh, Aegon is con. definitely not Jaehaerys' name. So this is like the beginning. This is the beginning. So this is before the histories were fleshed out. So you can just disregard that. And I like that though, to be honest. And I, and I, I really would like people not to go on a diatribe here, but to take that to heart because I think it's endearing and it shows that and it reminds people, not shows like they need proof that he's a human being, but it reminds people that authors are humans. George is human. And, uh, he obviously brought in Illyrio and, uh, Lit, Lit, Linda, right? Elio, uh, Elio, Elio and Linda. Well, no. 
Sorry, you get more views on your live stream than I'm okay. But uh, yeah, but y- y- it is true. He brought them in for continuity because his strength is not that. So like this is like I, I kind of like that type of stuff. Not that I want a whole bunch of retcon stuff. But no, it, it just shows you that like he is this gardener that we, we say he is because he was still he was still planting that seed and the seed is strong. Ned is like, so are you sure like this was natural causes? Are you sure like there's nothing suspicious here? And Grandmaster Pycelle is like, no, it's no stranger than any other death. And Ned is like, his wife thought otherwise. <laughs> and then Grandmaster is like, I recall that now. <laughs> the widow is sister to your own noble wife. If an old man may be forgiven his blunt speech, let me say that grief can derange even the strongest and most disciplined of minds. <laughs> and the Lady Lysa was never that. And I was just like, ooh, That's burn. That's true, but though. It's so true. It's so true. All due respect. Have you met the bitch? You know what I mean? Like, it, it is It is what it is. Uh, it, it, it is him just pretty much saying, listen, I respect that this is your wife's sister. But she's cray and like that, it, it, you know, go go take a visit up there to but, the. And this is what gives it away that my Maester Pycelle knows exactly what happened. Ned says, so you're certain that John Aaron died of a sudden illness. I am, Pycelle replied gravely. If not illness, my good Lord, what else could it be? Poison, Ned suggested quietly. Now listen to this. Pycelle's sleepy eyes flicked open. <laughs> The aged maester shifted uncomfortably in his seat. A disturbing thought. We are not the free cities where such things are common. Ooh. Yeah, bitch. You know what happened. And you're just going to sit there and act all shocked and shift all uncomfortable in your chair. And to me, that body language that Martin is right now, it says he knows more than what he's letting on. Absolutely. It really does remind you again. It reminds it reminds me. I'll speak for myself. It reminds me of, of how great of a writer George really is with his descriptive storytelling. Right. Like what I talked about before with the whisper uh, and then him tensing up right here. Again, this is the visualization, which they did do in all fairness. Great on screen as well. But yeah. And then he's a little bit of uh, 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 nationalism here, or at least blaming on the immigrants. He's like, we're not the free cities. You know, we're not. We're not vagabonds. Or we're not. We're not these type of people. Uh, and yeah, you know. Uh, but in all fairness, poisoning is like an overwhelming amount of toxins in the blood. So I guess you know that would right. be a sudden and the, illness. And you know what else is fucked up? Maester Pycelle straight up pins this shit on bears. <laughs> like I don't think he was poisoned, but if he was. <laughs> It was probably Varys. It's like the maid stole it, right? It's so... Yeah, like, because they're like, Ned's like, uh, poison is the women's weapon. And Pycelle's like, women, cravens, and eunuchs. Oh, yeah, he dressed. Varys was born a slave in lease, did you know? Put not your trust in spiders, my lord. He's like, also men that don't have genitals at the moment. Like, you know, there's, right. no, there's no unsullied walking around the court at, at, at the minute. And he dismisses his maester... Mr. Coleman, look him up on Wikipedia. They don't even have anything for him. They didn't even bother because Pycel out out at him, uh, it, you know, because he said he didn't understand the older body, uh, which seems odd, in my opinion, for, for a maester, uh, uh, especially a maester for Lord Aaron himself to not understand Lord Aaron. But I trust Pycel. Seems overwhelmingly shady to dismiss him, though, because why wouldn't you just why do you need to get rid of him completely? Right. I don't think that you do. Yeah, obviously you don't. But like, I mean, like, what is the like justification of that? He's so inept. You know what I mean? Like, cause that, that, that's a, that's obviously maesters are, are maesters. You, you, again, I will, I will defer to you. They're, they're, cho- or they're at least approved by, by the Lord, right? Like you can't just be, have a maester forced upon you. Like, I'm sure they could send one. I'm sure you have a say in this. Like if he was so inept, what I'm getting at is like, it's kind of a slight at Lord Aaron as well, right? Like if this guy was a moron, that he would allow him to be his maester. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Fuck my maester Pycel. He's the dick. <sighs> oh no, you're going to lose a big demographic of those Pycellers. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I really just, I can't stand him. Like I just can't. Right. I wish he would fall down the serpentine steps <sighs> in this chapter, but he doesn't. So... On the way back to Ned's chambers, um, he comes up on Arya practicing her water dancing. Mm -hmm. Um, She's doing like all this training stuff where like she's trying to stand on her toes and shit for hours. She's just doing her training. 
Yeah, she's showing her dedication to the craft. He got her the Bravosi water dancer, and uh, she's. This is a way. You, it's a little bit, a little bit funny, right? You know, like the, you know, this sounds more like ballerina uh, training, but also yeah. this is a part of the water dancers. You know, this is more of a Florentine way. This is more of a Renaissance way of swordsmanship. So this is a a more of a dance rather than the Westerosi knight that hacks away, right? So like mm-hmm. she's, and it's also a good character development. Uh, uh, we'll go too much into it but yeah it works because it it, it also will fit more for uh, you know not being misogynistic but she is a young girl so obviously like give her a, a broad sword a great sword right and like have her like you know piercing through like plate you know wouldn't be ideal but so this this is applicable to her so this is more about this is like as a boxer you know like i would say this is more about like form and technique other than strength which is actually very true so, yeah, I think I like it. I like this. This is, really is a mixture of everything Ned's got going on. But Ned's having one heck of a day right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is. So um, Ned also, like, flashes back on, like, Bran, getting the news about Bran. Mm-hmm. And Arya asks Ned, you know, what will Bran do when he's of age? And Ned, you know, like, he has years to find that answer, Arya. For now, it is enough to know that he will live. And I don't know, like, there's this whole passage where like Sansa has a dream mm-hmm. that she sees Bran smiling and Bran is going to be a knight. A knight of the King's Guard. Yeah. And Arya's like, can he still be a knight? And Ned's like, no. Someday he may be the lord of a great holdfast and sit on the king's council. He might raise castles like Bran and the Builder or sail a ship across the Sunset Sea or enter your mother's faith and become the High Septon. But he will never run beside his wolf again, he thought, with sadness too deep for words or lie with a woman or hold his own son in his arms. Arya cocked her head to one side. Can I be a king's counselor and build castles and become the High Septon? You? Ned said, kissing her lightly on the brow, will marry a king and rule his castle and your sons will be knights and princes and lords. Arya screwed up her face. No, she said, that's Sansa. She folded up her right leg and resumed her balancing. Ned sighed and left her there. So I love this scene in the show and I love this scene in the books. In the show, you know, Arya does that. That's not me. Yeah. But in the books, it's that Sansa. And I always think that Ned and Arya have this strong connection that they have because Arya is like Liana. Yes. Ned sees Liana in Arya. And also this is a narrative on, okay, so w- what what they're talking about fundamentally here is the difference between just being alive and living, right? So that that's that's the, the crossroad in which Bran is currently in. To start from where we start, you know, with the beginning of that quote, that's I, I really think this is a quote that's worth investigating, meaning, you know, will he die? No, he will not. Right. Like at this point, they do not believe he'll die. But then Aria, what she is fundamentally asking, in my opinion, is will, will he live? Because I think, that you know, live a life. Right. Right. Like, it, like what it, kind of life will he have? Yes. Quality of life, meaning, uh, you know, and, and so forth. So. What's interesting here is this serves a, a number of different masters, you know, per se, like uh, uh, philosophically, because Arya is privy to the fact that he is unable to do the things in which he wants to do or like she thinks that he wanted to do. And, and, and Bran did. Right. Like he wanted to be a knight. He, he had right. he, he did have these uh, intentions. What what little what, I still want to be a knight. Make me a knight, somebody. Um, but, you know, uh, I she, knight you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, I do have a sword. Uh, but anyways. Um, and then, so, but the point is that I'm trying to get to is that then she asks, okay, but I'm able bodied. I'm practicing, right? So there is this misogyny here as well, right? Because she cannot, why can she not? Not because she's not, uh, able in body, but she, because she's not, uh, it's not uh, applicable to her in gender. So it's right. another narrative on what makes. So I think it's a societal, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful mix of like philosophy and just a, a practical way at, at, at looking at life. Sometimes we, we yearn to be the richest person in the world. And then if you get sick, you just yearn to live another day. It, it suits the narrative that's an ongoing thread throughout this whole story, which is this misogyny, right? And- yeah. Misogyny is a big part of Arya's storyline and Brienne's as well. Like we see that they do not fit the societal normal for Westeros Mm -hmm. and they are both breaking the norms and breaking these tropes of men 
are the knights and women are in the kitchen raising the babies. So they are breaking those molds. And I, that that's why I really love A Feast for Crows. I really love Brian, mm-hmm. those Brienne chapters and the Arya stuff. So, yeah. It's not a coincidence that she is training during this, right? Like, that's what I'm trying to get at is that right. he can't be a knight because his legs don't work. She's not able to be a knight because she's a girl. Not because she's not able to do it, but right. because society tells. So there's the physical versus the uh, ideological. After he leaves Arya to her uh, practice or training, whatever she's doing, um, he he goes in to his solar or to his room or whatever. And we find out that Littlefinger is there. And he's like, Littlefinger, like, why are you here? And he's like, you know, I promised Kat that I would help you. I would help you. Um find out about whatever you're trying to find out little finger brings up sir hugh of the veil vale. like what are your thoughts and feels about sir hugh of the veil vale? well again another brilliant setup here because we know that maester what's his face and it doesn't matter look it up you know i mean really just coleman. i mean yeah coleman i mean yeah i'm just i actually know it i have it in front of me here i'm just using it to, to prove a point further the point what's his face isn't there but hugh is advanced so if you're dismissing a man's maester and then Sir Hugh is elevated after. You have to ponder. What about his actions elevated him opposed to what's his face? We just got sent home, right? Like, so there's obviously a conflict here and there's obviously something to look into and it doesn't seem right. It's like, okay, so one person at McDonald's, you know, an order wasn't filled at McDonald's. Well, like Two people everyone. needed to fill it. One's a manager now and one's fired. Like, what the hell? Like, like, right. like, like what's going on here? But everyone that was in his household left, except for Sir Hugh. The That's what I, yeah, yeah. That my, stewards, it's a bad hamburger Captain metaphor. Captain of his guards, his knights, all of his retainers all went with Liza, except for this person. So what did he do? It, because nothing went well, is, is the point, right? That, that elevates him. So that And that why would him. Robert knight him? Like Robert knighted him. Why would Robert knight him? Alcohol. <laughs> He's drunk? Yeah, bro. I mean, you just knighted me. <laughs> Uh, I know you're just tired, but you just know I mean? but no, uh, yeah, no, that is a valid, but you know, like obviously it shows that there was a, a, there was something that was advantageous. There was a, motive. no, I knighted you cause you're my friend and you want to be a knight. So I knighted you. Oh, well, but why would Robert <laughs> knight going. this boy? Because he was close to John Aaron and John Aaron died. So just knight him. Well, John Aaron is, no, yeah. I mean, obviously it shows, it shows a little bit of, uh, you know, malicious, a little bit of seedy behavior that one man, okay, uh, Q Bono, uh, the most popular Latin phrases for pseudo intellectuals like myself to, to learn. Uh, who benefits? That's what you ask when you see a crime. Who benefits off of it? Q Bono. Sir Hugh is Q Bono. He's the one that benefits, right? So why? Did he benefit off of this? Is it circumstantial? Doesn't seem like it. Brilliantly put, right? All jokes aside, the hell is Robert's not just, I mean, Robert might be a drunkard, but I don't really think he knights people willy nilly. He, he's a, he's a warrior. One thing he takes seriously, it's fighting, right? Like it is. Right. I, I don't think he's just going to be all, all for that. Um, and yeah, there's little reason for that. Everybody else was sent home. One person wasn't. That person not only was not sent home, they advanced. What did they do? I would say, Sir Hugh. And he would say, who are you? I'd be like, well, just don't worry about that. But what did you do? What did you do during this time that got you knighted? You know what I mean? Because being knighted, it, it usually takes some sort of a, a, of deed of integrity yeah. and virtue. So what Littlefinger does is he throws this idea out there. I think a parent for, in my opinion, Sir Hugh knows more than what Littlefinger wants. Like, like Littlefinger knows that Sir Hugh's about to die. Yeah. He knows that he's about to die. He knows it's going to throw more suspicion into the pile. Like Littlefinger is really trying to cause chaos. So Littlefinger takes this opportunity to school Ned a little bit. Like these spies are for this person. These spies are for this person. This spy works for Varys. Like he's telling him like the spider has people everywhere. He takes that time to ask Ned Stark, you know, like, is there someone that you trust like a hundred percent. Yeah. Is, is there one person in your service or is there a person in your service that you trust a hundred percent? And Ned Stark is like, yes. And Littlefinger is like, well, in that case, I have a delightful palace in Valyria that I would love 
to sell you. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's more like mocking. I think we talked about this before about how Littlefinger just mocks the fuck out of Ned every time he's around him. Yes. Um, he mocks him and just like kind of belittles him. And Ned never even catches on that he's doing it. It this is the a, a classic example of two men each have shortcomings. Obviously, we like Ned more than Littlefinger. Um, you know, if you like Littlefinger, I mean, congratulations, but, uh, they both have shortcomings. Littlefinger is clever. Ned is strong. Uh, Ned is so simplistic in his thinking, right? That, that he looks at this as, oh, this man, I mean, the best way to earn somebody's trust is to do something that would seem disadvantageous to you. Meaning to say, to to say you took a cookie from a cookie jar, you know, to show yourself in like, maybe not the best light or, or do as Littlefinger's doing, which is acting against the people that he has to like get along with at court right like he is like showing like some sort of like clairvoyancy blah 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 like he's showing some sincerity fainted you know uh sincerity to ned in this instance he is saying listen man the look at how much information i'm giving you and ned is so dead set on just saying where's the evil let me find the evil and hulk smash it that he is he is just eating this crap up both are playing to each other's uh, weaknesses you know uh, their own strong suits but they're playing you know to the other's weaknesses ned just wants to find the evil and suss it out little finger understands that he is a fairly simple man and he just wants the simplest of answers and he is going to be able to prove his worth to him and he thinks that you know honesty can be definitely uh, de- depicted to him in a very dishonest way because he also admits during this conversation one of the famous lines the smartest thing you ever did was not trusting me right so that that again is like this classic example of like sociology and in and, and, and sociopathic behavior 101 give somebody a small fault of your own to gain their trust because it's like oh that's not a good thing that justin told me so maybe maybe he he's a good guy and he's being honest with me it's like oh i'm giving yeah. you like a little bit of information you know i'm, I'm not really doing this people yeah i be falling for that shit all the time. i'm a really good guy, guy. <laughs> Like, I'm really good. Listen, I did this one thing. No, uh, but it is a classic sociopathic uh, tendency in the, you know, I, I t- listen, I watched some YouTube videos. I'm not a sociopath uh, on it. So oh, it is. God. It, but you get what I'm coming at. Like, he is. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, fault. he's he's showing his faults. Like, you know what I mean? And even it and it works on Ned because Ned's so fucking thick headed. Yeah. Like, it works on Ned because Ned is like, you know, Lord Peter, I'm grateful for your help. Perhaps I was wrong to distrust you. He was yeah. like, you are slow to learn, Lord Eddard. Distrusting me was the wisest thing you've done since you climbed down off your horse. So he gives him honesty Yes. at the same time. Because the honesty is only proven, though, because there is a certain amount of, of dirt that he shares about himself, right? So it seems more sincere in that that's what really sells it, is that he says, listen, like he's also like schooling him a little bit. He's like... Don't you gotta you gotta be better, man. Trust me. You can't be trusting me all that much either. I'm like, okay, okay, I trust you on this. I trust, you know, which is a paradox in itself. But it really is very effective. Uh, it's been proven to be. And it is an intelligent move on Littlefinger for the time being, but also it just shows Ned's very much so, like you said, he's uh <laughs> head as thick as a castle uh, wall, right? Uh, right. uh like Dunk the Lunk. He really is, and he is so just set on this path to just suss this evil out crush this evil like you know he says in the show blah 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 i don't think he says in the books you know like quick to anger slow mind blah 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 but it, you know it's true uh but also you know we see a whole lot of this machiavellian-esque behavior which is all bs it's a hundred page book of common sense i think it's an ir- ironic book but not to get there and it is what it is and it also comes to bite your ass because you piss off enough people that'll fuck you up trust me you're eventually you're gonna get fucked up uh as, as we see but yeah it, it is our time uh sorry I, I, okay I'll, I'll rephrase it uh if you if you <laughs> I'll rephrase it. So if you mess with enough people that can beat you up, uh, you know what I mean? Eventually you're going to catch a punch. So, and we see that that will happen. So it does work in, in the time being, but it's also not all that smart. It's this very, you know, I, I call it, it's pseudo intellectual Machiavellian per se behavior. It's, uh, it's, I hate behavior. that fucking word. It's such a, yeah. <laughs> it's it's if the leader's genius. bad, don't That's go against the people, word. go against the leader. I'm like, oh, really? Thanks. But I will say that, like, to me, the best player of the Game of Thrones is between Littlefinger and Varys. Yes. Definitely. Between and I feel like it, privately. I feel like it's set up in this chapter just how good Littlefinger is. Even in the cat, I think it was Cat 3, even in that chapter, like Littlefinger 
you could tell the seeds were being planted that he's gonna be like this this the this genius this, the this there's a lot of pawns and there's a king and there's some queens but i think little finger is the real queen well like on the chessboard like he's the one he's the one i don't even know he I don't would, know how to play chess, so I don't. He would know be the player. He would be the player. Like the queen is like the most powerful. The king is the weakest when you play chess. The queen is the most powerful. This is a, really wow. Yeah, that is that is incredibly progressive. The good queen, for chess, the, good for chess, right? The king can only move one space. The queen can move as many spaces. Can the in queen any move direction. backwards as well? Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, that's a little bit. Uh, I think the queen can just yeah. do what the fuck ever. I mean, that's how it should be. Like queens run this shit. Yeah, what is it? A king can move a man, but cannot move like a soul. Blah blah blah. I just watch Kingdom of Heaven. We'll get into it. Yeah, I'll learn about chess though. Yeah, that is incredibly pro- good on you, chess. To be the the, the and the, look how old it is, right? Yeah, yeah, the chosen game of ignorant fucks from <laughs> the beginning <laughs> of time, but one of the most progressive time. It also said that uh, bishops can get married, so uh, there you go. Yeah, oh, we're but, gonna wrap this up now. Yeah, yeah okay. we're like uh, talked about chess and shit. <laughs> well, you brought it up. I didn't know. I couldn't it. help it. I couldn't help it. Anytime I think of Varys and Littlefinger, I automatically think of chess. So that is Edward five and i will be seeing you guys next week thank you justin for coming i will leave all of justin's links below and you guys have a great day